sorry, Luke, Luke 2. We're still in Luke. Gotta get it, gotta get it all straightened out here. So Luke 2, 15 to 20. No. Oh. We're not even doing we're not even doing the next scripture lesson yet. We're doing the sermon because I got everything out of order. Because I wanted to goof at you up today. So in her book, Accidental Saints, the Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber, who by the way is very feisty. If you haven't read her, you should. She's worth reading. She has a book called Finding God in All the Wrong People. And she starts out by writing a chapter on Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she ends the chapter with these words. There is a reason Mary is everywhere. I've seen her image all over the world, in cafes in Istanbul, in students' backpacks in Scotland, in a market stall in Jakarta, but I don't think her mess image is everywhere because she is a reminder to be obedient, and I don't think it has to do with social revolution. Images of Mary remind us of God's favor. Mary is what it looks like to believe that we are already who God says we are. We are already who God says we are. So here's the question. Who does God say that we are? But he says, I think, through Mary and through many other people in the Bible, is that we are people who are carriers of God. We are people pregnant with the sacred and ready to birth God. We are people ready to be the place where heaven touches earth. Perhaps Mary's role was singular, and yes, she birthed God in a unique and special way, but the words that she uses when she speaks to Elizabeth are words that become our words because her story becomes our story. She says simply, my soul magnifies the Lord. Those words may say it all. My soul magnifies the Lord. Now magnify, of course, means to make bigger or to make greater or to enlarge, which if you think about the image of Mary growing big with the baby Jesus makes a lot of sense. But perhaps it is better to say, rather than makes larger, it is better to say that to magnify makes things more easily seen. My soul magnifies the Lord. It means that although Mary, through Mary, the sacred became more visible, more concrete, more easily seen. She brought us the Christ. She brought us Jesus, who was the sacred in our midst. So one of the things that Mary is intended to teach us is that we are all to be souls who magnify the Lord. We are all to be people through whom the sacred becomes more real. People who make it so that others can see God more clearly. If the Bible is a reliable witness, God works through ordinary, common people to become present in the world. It is not through amazing, brilliant, outstanding people that God works. It is through people like me and people like you. God becomes more real to the world through the way we, as common people, choose to live our lives and practice our faith. That is the way that God makes sacred presence felt in the world. Each one of us, through our words and our actions, through all that we do, magnifies God. We magnify God's being with our own bodies. We magnify God's action through our actions. We magnify God's word through our words. We magnify God's love with our love. Now, of course, we have to be clear when we say this. It is not ultimately about us. God is the one who acts. What we do is
is we take what God plants in us, God's love, and we give it hands and feet and hearts and minds. We collaborate with God in the divine actions of lifting up the lowly, feeding the hungry, taking care of the homeless. This is our job, our one job as those who would follow the Christ. So a good question to meditate on in the remaining time before Christmas might be, how do I magnify God? How do I magnify the Lord? It's actually a very challenging question, right? Because our default is to think that this is too big a task for any of us, and that whatever it is we would have to do to magnify God must be big and amazing. But another important lesson that Mary's prayer teaches us is that it doesn't have to be big and amazing and that we, as common as we are, are enough. Whoever we are, whatever resources we have, whatever we have or haven't done, we are enough. The song of Mary reminds us that all of scripture points to the little, points to the lowly, points to the kind of who me as the vehicle for God's action. The Christmas story itself confirms this. Bethlehem is nothing special. Yeah, it's the city of David, but it wasn't big and it wasn't important. Elizabeth was the wife of a priest, but she was barren, and women who were barren in Israel were considered pretty much zeros. Mary is a pregnant teenager, total no one. Joseph, another nobody, just the carpenter, right? The first people to reach the stable. The shepherds, who were so ritually unclean that they wouldn't even have been allowed to go to church, if you want to call the synagogue a church. So all through scripture, whenever God wants to do something, it's the little ones, the ordinary ones, the unexceptional ones that God uses. When God wants to create, God reaches into the mud. When God wants to redeem all of creation, God enters that creation fully and completely in one of the most vulnerable creatures on the planet, a human child. So it is through human beings, through human flesh, this fragile and easily broken substance that is us, that salvation happens. It is through us that God works, and it is through us that God is magnified. Here I am, the servant of the Lord, Mary says. Let it be with me according to your word. Now notice what she does not say. She does not say, I am not worthy. Nor does she say, I am worthy. Her worthiness is not the point. Somehow this young woman understands that it's not about her, it's about God. And it's about willingness. Now of course it is not easy, all of this stuff. It is not easy to participate in the story the way that Mary did. In order to participate in the story, some would say you have to be a little weird. I love the way Madeline Lingle puts it in her poem after the Annunciation. This is the irrational season when love blooms bright and wild. Had Mary been filled with reason, there would have been no room for the child. None of this makes sense, this story that we celebrate, especially the idea that we can make God present, that we can make God present. Us, with all of our problems, all of our failings, all of our doubts, all of our weaknesses, all of our fears, us. Our participation is a miracle. Perhaps God should have had better judgment. But God chose to use us. And so God asks all of us, as illogical as it seems, what he asked of Mary. He asks us to participate in the miracle. He asks us to say yes. That's simply it. It's not an easy thing to say yes sometimes. But when we say yes, heaven touches earth here. 
Rob Bell in his book, The Velvet Elvis, talks about the need to live according to this new script that God writes at Christmas. And he too suggests that it does not have to be dramatic. It doesn't have to involve going to India. It doesn't have to involve selling all that we have and giving it away or doing big things. He writes in, his, in this book, I am learning that the church is at its best when it is underground, subversive, and counterculture. It is quiet, humble, stealth acts that change things. He tells of a woman who moved into a rough neighborhood so that she could tutor children and work with families. And as she worked with those families, she began to understand how impoverished they were and how simple the needs were that they had. And so she started to put a list together of the things that they needed. Things like heat, underwear, appliances, food. And she began to circulate the list among her church family and found people who could provide for those needs. Every one of them. He ends the story with this statement, which I really like. Jesus lives. Here's a toaster. We are how Jesus lives. In the Advent Carol, a song we sang last week, People Look East, there is a recurring refrain. Love is on the way. Love the guest is on the way. Love the rose is on the way. Love the bird, the star, the Lord is on the way. Well, we are how love arrives. Love is on the way. Here's a toaster. Love is on the way. Here's some firewood. Love is on the way. Here's a casserole. Love is on the way. Here's some cans of fruit and vegetables. Love is on the way. Here's a mattress. Love is on the way. I'm here to listen. Love is on the way. I care. I accept. I forgive. When the spirit is in it, our hearts get soft. And that's when it starts to happen. The sharing, the equality, the equity, the encouragement, the love, the acceptance, the humility. When the spirit is in us, when our hearts are soft, it becomes possible. Love begins to be born. Friends, the story of Christmas is about the sacred being in a young woman named Mary. But it's our story. The seed of the sacred lurks within each one of us. The spirit of the, the seed of the spirit is there, waiting to be born, waiting for us to nourish it, waiting for us to say yes, waiting for us to let it grow. Like Mary, we are pregnant with the sacred. And each day, our task is to allow that seed to flourish and bring it to birth. We are the carriers of love. We are the carriers of life. We are the carriers of the kingdom. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the story of Mary, and we thank you for her yes. And so we ask that you would help us to continue the story and to be people who say yes to your presence in us and yes to the task of sharing that presence with all around us. This we pray in the name of the Christ. Amen.